Hello and welcome to this lecture. The subject of this week is uh, Ruskin Bond's The Blue Umbrella and the interpretative angle that I am going for this week is the hidden fractures in the narrative of the blue umbrella. Okay, a brief introduction about this uh, beloved Indian writer Ruskin Bond. He is an Indian author of British descent and he is well known as the author of children's fiction and his first work The Room on the Roof won the John Lulens Riss Memorial Prize in 1957. And he has written several novellas and over 500 short stories, uh, poems and essays. He is also the recipient of the Sahitya Academy Award in 1992 and that award was for his collection Our Trees Still Grow in Dara and he has also been awarded the Padma Shri and Padma Bhushan. So he has been uh, a very, very well acknowledged and uh, awarded and renowned author of uh, British origin on, on, in the Indian subcontinent. Okay, now the blue umbrella, it is set in the Himachal Pradesh in the hills of this particular region in India and it is a heartwarming story about a little girl called Binya and her favorite possession which is a blue umbrella. The, on first appearance, it seems like a very, very uh, simple tale, but there are layers to this uh, particular short of uh, fiction, which we will unravel in our analysis. Now, uh, the major themes of this particular work are kindness, uh, generosity, greed and loyalty and Ruskin Bourne himself uh, has written that this is a work about greed and generosity among other things. So, he highlights these two qualities, but let us also look for other themes which are um, kind of underpinning the narrative framework of this uh, apparently simple tale of the blue umbrella. Now, what exactly is the story? So, let us take a quick look at the um, uh, story, the set of events that happen in this particular fiction. Uh, as I said, the story revolves around a little girl called Binya. Her full name is Binya Devi, but she is uh, known as Binya in the village, uh, in this uh, hill, uh, hilly village uh, in um, the Himachal Pradesh. And, um, the story kind of begins when she exchanges a necklace which has a claw pendant, uh, a leopard uh, leopard's claw pendant uh, for a blue umbrella from one of the uh, women from the town who picnics with her family on the um, hills, uh, in, on the hills near her village. So, this is the kind of the, in, uh, the initiation point, the beginning of the story and um, this particular blue umbrella uh, with which this girl is fascinated by also attracts the attention of the entire village and one of the people uh, who is very much uh, interested, seriously interested in this um, umbrella, blue umbrella uh, is Ram Barosa, a shopkeeper, an elderly shopkeeper who has a tea shop on the road to Terry. So, he offers to buy the umbrella from Binya, but Binya refuses any payment uh, and uh, she will not part with her uh, favorite object and uh, eventually Ram Barosa gets uh, his shop assistant, a little boy called uh, Raja Ram to steal it for him and um, Biju, Binya's brother foils the plan uh, there is a fight, a little fight at the end of the story between between uh, Binya's brother Biju and Raja Ram and uh, Biju gets the upper hand and finally snatches the umbrella back from this boy and gives it back to his sister. Um, and what happens uh, after that is that <coughs> Ram Barosa is exposed to the entire village as the man who has uh, gone after a little girl's um, possession and he ha is kind of ex uh, ostracized by the entire community. Nobody visits his shop, he is completely woe begone and he also is on the verge of financial uh, uh, bankruptcy. 
uh, and Abhinya who uh, observes all these changes that um, uh, kind of happen to Ram Barosa, how he um, becomes a very sad old man, changes her mind and eventually offers her favorite uh, object, the blue umbrella, back to the shopkeeper. And, um, and at the end of the story, Ram Barosa makes this umbrella the common property of the entire village. So whoever uh, wants, uh, wants to use the umbrella can borrow it from the uh, shop. Um, and it becomes a kind of an universal possession for the members of the village. That's how the story ends and Binya happily sings uh, as, she walks, um, as she walks up the uh, hills uh, um, near her village. So let's um, take a closer look at this central character, uh, Binya, um, and how her character has been set up by the narrator at the beginning of the story. So we have a third person narrator in the story and he, um, or the narrator is very well informed about the uh, functionings of this society, this hilly village um, in the Himalayas. And uh, he says that, the narrator says that the age is inde uh, indeterminate. She could have been 9 or 10 or 11 and um, this is the extract <coughs> that we are interested in in, uh, in, terms her, uh, in terms of her age. Uh, the narrator says Binya was probably 10. Uh, she may have been 9 or even 11. Uh, she, uh, she couldn't be sure because no one in the village kept birthdays. Uh, but her mother told her she had been born during a winter when the snow had come up to the windows and that was uh, just over 10 years ago wasn't it. And that last tag um, wasn't it uh, uh, is again a hint that even that particular landmark of a um, great winter um, uh, that happened uh, 10 years ago is, uh, is again the, the, the number of years um, is again very, very indeterminate. And nobody is absolutely sure when this big storm um, happened, when this big uh, winter storm happened. So they, they keep time according to major natural events in this particular village. Uh, and that's very interesting because uh, it suggests that this village uh, is not uh, perhaps in touch with modernity where um, you know uh, people tell time according to a particular year and people are very, very concerned about the passing of years. So um, again, this comment that no one in the village kept birthdays again hints at a very simplistic um, way of life um, in this particular village. And again, we are reminded of uh, a similar reference um, uh, in Summer Vacation by Kamala Das. If you recall this particular story, um, we uh, remember that um, Nani Amma's daughter uh, Amini um, is, uh, we do not know about her age and uh, Mutashi asks how old is she and uh, her mother says uh, I'm not sure but uh, she was born um, when there was this big um, flood um, years ago. So that kind of um, manner of keeping time uh, suggests that people are away from this particular modern system of um, measuring time and measuring the passage of years. So um, there are some parallels between this particular story, um, the Blue Umbrella and the Summer Vacation even though one is set in Kerala um, in the south and this is in the north and in the Himalayas. So um, village lifestyles uh, resemble, um, resemble are very very uh, similar in this context. So uh, again coming back to Binya, she is part of the mountains uh, almost according to the narrative uh, in this particular story and the narrator says Binya belonged to the mountains to this part of the Himalayas known as Garhwal. Uh, dark forest had no terrors for her. It was only when she was in the market town jostled by the crowds in the bazaar that she felt rather nervous and lost. So. Um, this is a fantastic narrative about uh, the essential 
uh, quality or character of Binya and the narrator suggests that um, she is at home in the hills and the mountains um, and she was completely unafraid in this particular space whereas she was a little bit anxious and uh, worried if she is jostled by the crowds in the bazaar in the market towns. So we have a contrast being set up here um, something that we need to make note of. So as I said, the mountains and the dark forest are her home, dark forest and uh, the darkness in the forest does not affect her and uh, elsewhere in the story, um, the narrator suggests that she was at home on a hillside and um, again, it is the town life, the way of life in towns and the bazaars that terrified her. So. Um, it's it's almost as if she is part of the uh, natural atmosphere of the Himalayas. That's the kind of um, sense that we get through the description of this particular girl in the blue umbrella. And um, Binya liked being on her own, and sometimes she allowed the cows to lead her into some distant valley, and then they would all be late coming home. Another um, uh, interesting characteristic of Binya is the fact that she liked to wander by herself um, on the on the hills. And um, in 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 her family, she's the one who is primarily uh, involved in looking after the cows. Therefore, she uh, sometimes let the cows wander into some distant valley so that she could follow them um, into those valleys and they all came back together and they would be late. Again, um, uh, this um, suggestion or the notion that she liked being uh, by herself alone uh, on the hillside or with these creatures, um, with these animals um, uh, as against all the, uh, all the crowded, um, you know, all the crowded people, um, uh, the crowds in the bazaar is again a very interesting um, uh, suggestion that is being highlighted here. Um, and and um, the cows, even the cows, they seem to prefer Binya to Biju because uh, Binya let them wander, whereas um, Biju would be, um, you know, interested in disciplining them uh, and getting them back home on time. So uh, Binya is somehow um, outside of time, uh, is a part of nature, is part of the Himalayas, uh, and and Biju, her brother, who is two years older than her, um, that um, you know that uh, age difference is uh, reinforced and precise in the context of um, Biju, but it becomes very, very, um, the exact age of Binya becomes very diffuse or, or con confusing and indeterminate in the case of the little girl and we, we need to think about that um, gender uh, kind of uh, difference in, in, in the sense of keeping time uh, for these two characters uh, in mind as well. So. Um, what what's the uh, what's what's the first interesting event in the life of Binya? At least when uh, this short fiction begins, is the fact that she um, trades her leopard's claw for this particular blue umbrella, and um, she she wears this um, necklace of uh, glass beads and on which hangs a leopard's claw, and that's her lucky charm, and. Um, she also uh, is very hard working despite the fact that she likes to wander around, despite the fact that she is kind of um, with nature, um, you know, almost communing with them uh, on her own. She uh, helps the family in grazing the cows, she fetches water from the spring, she carries uh, milk to the tea shop. Uh, she does a lot of hard work and um, that particular um, uh, information is important to understand the, um, the socio-economic subtext to this particular family, this family in which there is no father but just the mother and the two children Binya and Biju. And um, coming to Biju, the brother of uh, Binya, he is very interesting because unlike um, Binya, he goes to school. 
uh, and his real name is Vijay, but people all um, call him Biju in this particular village. And as I said um, a short while ago, uh, he is older than Binya by two years. The narrative is very, very uh, specific about that particular difference. And um, there are lots of references in the story um, to the fact that Biju is a school going boy. And um, at one point in the narrative, we have this reference, uh, we have this extract which says that he was on his way home from school. It was 2 o'clock and he hadn't eaten since 6 in the morning. So, um, and, and he's on his way back from school to his home. And uh, the fact that he hasn't eaten is again very important in underlining the uh, the the kind of um, socio-economic uh, you know uh, context of this particular family, uh, there there is a sense that this uh, family is not very comfortable economically, and um, there are other references in the story which suggest that Biju and Binya often um, do not have uh, a money to spare to buy uh, sweets or toffees. So. Um, they are hard working, they are not wealthy, they are on the verge of poverty, they just have enough to get by, barely. That's, that's the sense that the, uh, the story gives us. And these uh, facts are uh, something that are not very obvious when we read The Blue Umbrella because um, most of the readers do get taken away by the beauty of the landscape that's described by the simple lifestyle that these um, uh, people who uh, populate this world um, enjoy um, the love of nature, the description of nature. Um, you know, it, it's very atmospheric. It's it's too lush that we kind of forget about the hidden fractures, the hidden problems that underline um, the lives of these particular people in Ruskin Bond, especially in the Blue Umbrella. So the one uh, important thing that really uh, strikes me when I first read. Uh, when I first read this um, fiction is the fact that Binya doesn't go to school, uh, but Biju does even um, though that there is uh, just two years difference between them. So uh, she is of an age when uh, she is supposed to be in school, but she doesn't go because um, of the uh, economic status of this particular uh, family. In terms of Biju's characterization, he is a boy who goes to school, but that doesn't mean that he doesn't contribute to the running of the family. Uh, he works really hard uh, and um, it's very interesting to see that he also helps with the cows and he also helps with the other uh, aspects of the family which need his attention and he hardly has any money to spend um, even when he is hungry and that is suggested in uh, one very interesting episode when uh, he returns from school and uh, uh, it has been hours since he has eaten but uh, he just stops there uh, by the side of the tea shop and looks at all the sweets there uh, in Ramboros shop and uh, the narrator says he didn't have any mine, money to spend at Ramboros shop but he stopped there anyway to look at the sweets in the glass jars. Um, that's that's a, a very uh, important uh, aspect of their life and something that gets usually um, uh, unnoticed uh, because of the charm with which uh, the power of Ruskin Bond's pen, um, you know, paints a picture of all these uh, hilly terrains and the simple folk and the simple joys of their life. So the pain somehow becomes uh, marginal. But in this particular analysis of the blue umbrella, I'm uh, trying to explore the areas which uh, show all these false lines, these serious uh, issues that are somehow um, underneath um, the way of life of these people. So uh, what about the complication in the story? So the initiation in, in the initiation also has the complication. Uh, when Binya exchanges her lucky charm uh, with the picnickers, um, she is creating a complication not only for herself but also for the entire village community. Um, so she is 
uh, attracted by um, this blue umbrella which one of the women in the picnic party has and um, this uh, episode happens when she is uh, wandering by herself one day in the you know, slopes of the hills and she comes across this party of picnickers who are uh, enjoying a, a meal um, and, and, and she notices that thing and, and she watches uh, uh, from behind the trees and the umbrella, the narrative says that the blue umbrella uh, is a frilly thing for uh, women uh, but then uh, to Binya the umbrella was like a flower a great blue flower that had sprung uh, on the dry brown hillside um, the contrast is beautiful there uh, it's like a flower on the on the brown landscape of the hill and that really attracts the attention and uh, the narrator says that normally she would have turned and fled, but the attraction was the pretty blue umbrella. It had cast a spell over her, drawing her forward almost against her will. Um, Binya usually doesn't like to uh, be in the company of uh, a lot of people that has been mentioned uh, early on in the story, um, but then um, this blue umbrella makes Binya come out from her hideout uh, from behind the trees and the narrator says that it's almost as if a spell has been cast on this little girl. Uh, there is magic. There is magic in this blue umbrella which is drawing this girl uh, from behind her uh, safety curtain of trees and uh, despite the fact that Binya is also distracted by uh, the display of food. Um, there's a lot of food which the picnickers have uh, and, and uh, they're uh, sharing the, the food but uh, Binya gazes hungrily at the, at the display but then, uh, but then she is primarily interested um, in the umbrella and that suggestion that she's gazing hungrily at the food uh, again points to the poverty in the hills and one of the men also uh, mentions the fact that um, they are all very poor um, in the hills and, and the, one of them notices the fact that she is dressed uh, almost in uh, rags. So again um, all these uh, references give us a picture that uh, life is difficult for her, uh, for Binya and her brother and her family in this um, hill village. But then, despite all the uh, uh, trials and tribulations and the scarcity, um, they are kind of um, attracted uh, and they, ha they derive a lot of joy in the beautiful things in nature in, in the hilly regions. So, uh, the narrator says that uh, she may have been timid with uh, uh, strangers, but then um, when uh, she notices the blue umbrella, somehow that object erases her timidity and she has the, uh, the strength uh, to uh, refuse money twice because uh, one of the men in the group, um, the husband of the young woman, he offers her two rupees first and Binya just shakes her head saying no um, uh, in exchange for the leopard claw necklace that she wears and then he offers her five rupees, again she refuses and um, because the young woman, the wife is uh, insistent on having the leopard claw pendant, uh, he kind of suggests please look at um, the stuff that's there here, what do you want in exchange and without any hesitation um, Binya points to the umbrella and um, gets it eventually even though they are uh, offended somehow by her um, request but then uh, the episode hints at the silent strength, the persistence in the little girl to get what she wants. So that is made clear in this particular episode which begins the story. So uh, once, um, once the blue umbrella comes into the village economy uh, of the hilly regions of the Himalayas, um, it causes trouble. And um, the shopkeeper Ram Barossa, he notices this uh, blue umbrella that Binya has and he um, asks where did you get it from and she says I traded it for uh, my uh, leopard claw and he says it's just a pretty thing for ladies to play with. 
Um, and, and the hint here is that um, it, this umbrella is for a lady, what are you doing with it? You are not a lady, you, you are not expected to play with this sort of thing. And um, the narrator comments uh, and, and says that it was just a beautiful plaything, and that was exactly why, and that was exactly why she had fallen in love with it. The fact that she could play with this umbrella, um, and uh, considering the context of Binya in the mountains, um, most of her time is engaged in um, being productive, contributing something uh, to the family, to the uh, running of the family uh, and, and um, since she does not seem to have anything to play with, this particular object, the blue umbrella becomes doubly attractive for, uh, to her and um, the narrator says that that is exactly why she wants to own that thing. So, the non-functionality uh, of the blue umbrella uh, is the most important uh, attraction for um, Binya and um, added to that fact is that it is very aesthetically pleasing, it is very, uh, it's very beautiful and the narrator says that it is like a patch of blue and um, it is such an attractive thing to own, to have. And uh, this beautiful materiality, it is a material object um, that is beautiful and, and that is why Binya wants to own it because it is so very different to all the things that are there in the village for Binya. Um, she, uh, she uh, and the narrator says that they do have an umbrella at home but it is black, it is no longer um, in use and, and it is old. But this thing, this beautiful thing, this uh, umbrella is um, something extremely attractive because it is not part of the village, it is um, not uh, functional, it is uh, from the uh, city and it is very modern and beautiful. So, uh, it the blue umbrella cat catches the attention not only of um, the shopkeeper Ram Barosa, it gets the attention of everyone and um, once Binya walks with it everywhere, uh, she is kind of almost known as the girl with the uh, blue umbrella. So, uh, she gets noticed and perhaps that is an added attraction for Binya in owning this object which has come from the town, from the city. Um, the, the fact that she is known as the owner of this thing is very important to her. Now, uh, let us look at the uh, antagonist in the story, one of the chief antagonists in the story and that is Ram Barosa and uh, his name literally means Ram the trustworthy and it is an ironic name because as the story uh, progresses uh, everybody understands that he cannot really be trusted, even the children know uh, not to trust him. So, um, there is a lot of irony in the name and um, he as I said has a tea shop on the road to Theri, uh, the place called Theri and Bin, Bin, Binya and Biju whenever they have uh, spare coins with them, they spend it at um, Ram Barosa's tea shop on sweets and toffees and um, the, he occupies an important position in the village um, in the village in this particular story. Now, uh, Ram Barosa is not trusted by the children and that is made clear when uh, the narrator uh, suggests that um, even um, Biju does not like to take stuff on credit from Ram Barosa and he says that um, some, sometimes um, the children get tempted by Ram Barosa to buy sweets and toffee on credit and uh, at the end of the month they, uh, they buy more sweets than they can afford to pay him and therefore they would have to hand over to Ram Barosa some of their most treasured possessions such as a curved knife for cutting grass or a small hand axe or a jar for pickles or a pair of ear earrings 
and these had become the shopkeeper's possessions and were kept by him or sold in his shop. So, uh, we have an, um, an elderly trickster sort of character in this um, uh, short fiction and uh, we can see that he is a shrewd collector of stuff. Um, he, he likes to collect things just as children uh, um, would love to collect such um, you know uh, intricate stuff. So, there is a parallel here between the children and um, Ram Barossa because Ram Barossa loves to own the possessions that the children love to own. So, uh, we can see an equation between these two um, types of uh, characters in this particular story. And uh, if you look at the uh, kind of items that he gets from the children, a curved knife for cutting grass, a small object, a small hand axe, a jar for pickles, uh, or a pair of uh, earrings, intricate things, lovely things. And sometimes the shopkeeper keeps them in his store or sometimes he sells them if he is not attracted too much um, by these objects. Um, so, uh, the other, so he is magpie like somehow because magpies like to collect um, stuff that it gets attracted by even though it is no longer of functional use for, for it. So, uh, just like a magpie, Rambaros are also at times uh, stores things um, and uh, it becomes very clear that he exploits um, the innocence of these children because he tempts them with sweets, with these toffees and uh, traps them and um, his uh, behavior uh, suggests that he is also exploiting the poverty of the children um, from these villages. And um, Biju and Binya are clever enough not to fall into the trap, the trap laid by Rambarosa. Okay, so uh, once the umbrella comes into the village, once it enters the village, there are repercussions um, all around. Um, it becomes the envy of the village folk. Everybody is jealous of Binya and um, the narrator lists out um, at least two specific individuals to uh, expose their uh, jealousy. So, the first person uh, the narrator mentions is the schoolmaster's wife and uh, she is annoyed by the fact that a poor cultivator's daughter is able to own such a pretty beautiful thing whereas, she herself who has obtained second class BA owns just a simple uh, black umbrella. So, um, she is bringing into play the class divisions in society when um, it is understood that a poor cultivator's daughter is supposed to own something really very uh, modest uh, and, and, and assuming and she is not and the poor cultivator's daughter is not supposed to own a pretty little frilly thing uh, which the ladies are supposed to have. So, those kind of uh, fractures in society are brought to the surface through the behavior of some of the characters in the village. And uh, very interestingly, um, the husband of this, um, uh, the husband, the schoolmaster offered to have their old umbrella dyed blue. Uh, she gave him such a scornful look and loved him a little less than before. Um, so, this comment is uh, funny, there is a comic side to this um, with, the, uh, with the husband trying to please um, uh, the wife uh, by you know coming up with a solution, but that solution seems so silly, um, so impractical, uh, impractical to the lady, to the wife that she gives him a scornful look and she loves him a little, uh, a little less for, uh, than before. So, the love, um, the, the amount of love is somehow tied to the quality of the solutions uh, the husband offers. So, that is very interesting and funny. But the uh, interesting, um, the, the most significant thing here is the fact that relations became, become strained. There is a tension, there is a pressure 
on bonds, um, bonds between human beings, bond between, bonds between husband and wife um, because of the presence of the umbrella in the village. So we can also see this um, uh, in, from a larger angle too, uh, which is the uh, impact of uh, material culture on uh, human emotions and sentiments and way of life. Such a small thing as a beautiful umbrella it has the power to even touch um, a, a supposedly strong emotional bond between couples. So um, that, that uh, relationship becomes evident. Okay, um, I want to compare this couple, the, the schoolmaster and his wife, um, to the young woman and her husband uh, who were picnicking on the hillside and um, whose umbrella that uh, Binya eventually gets by trading her uh, leopard's cloth. So I want to compare um, their exchange because uh, we can see how, um, uh, how parallel there are resemblances between this couple and that couple too. Um, so this is the exchange that um, the young woman has with her husband just before she offers her umbrella to Binya at the beginning of the story. So when the young woman understands that Binya wants her umbrella, she says, um, she wants my umbrella, what cheek, uh, how dare she, you know, uh, what insolence. Well, you want her pendant, don't you? That's the uh, uh, response of the husband. You want her pendant, um, isn't it? That's different, is it? The man and his wife are beginning to quarrel with each other. Again, um, the idea that the umbrella, this simple little thing, this inanimate thing which comes in between um, the husband and the wife is very, very important. So ruptures between couples happen over this simple umbrella, this beautiful umbrella. And again, the idea that um, it is insolent of Binya to want to possess um, her umbrella, this young woman's umbrella is also very important because the woman thinks that she is not supposed to own such stuff. She being a simple poor little kid from the uh, hills and how dare she uh, wants to own my beautiful umbrella. And then um, again, uh, we see a sort of a, a, a resemblance between the husband here, the man here and the schoolmaster because both of them uh, want to please um, their temperamental, um, superficial, materialistic wives. And um, th there is dysfunctionality in all these domesticities that we see. Uh, they don't seem to be perfect and the women are m less admirable than the men. Um, in such context, in such marital context, the women come off badly. Uh, they are shown as being too materialistic, too class conscious. Um, that's something we need to keep an eye out for. Okay, the other character who um, envies um, the blue umbrella is the Pujari in the temple and Bond, Ruskin Bond specifically mentions this character uh, in the story. Uh, so the first reference is to the schoolmaster's wife and the next is to the Pujari of the local temple. And he wants to assert, uh, assert his superiority over Binya by buying a multicolored umbrella from um, the city from the town. So uh, the multicolor umbrella again uh, suggests a comic touch to this desire on the part of the Pujari and he does really uh, attempt to buy one and then he returns empty handed from the town saying that such things can be bought only uh, from Delhi and not from the nearest town and he is really disappointed by his failure. And um, again, this particular um, episode uh, suggests that even the spiritual uh, people are not outside of the pale of this idea of jealousy. And again, um, for them, it's very jarring that this poor little girl, a uh, cultivator's daughter, has such a beautiful thing, whereas um, they who occupy the higher strata in society have um, no such thing. So that is um, really affecting their psyche, their egos in such ways that they really want to do something about it. 
Now, um, so some of them try to get the better of Binya by trying to get the same thing or something better than um, the blue umbrella and which they fail to eventually. And there are another group in the village who adopt the sour grapes philosophy. I mean, if they can't have it, then obviously the umbrella is not good enough. Um, so this is the narrative that um, they form about the umbrella, the blue umbrella that Binya has. So most people console themselves by saying that Binya's pretty umbrella wouldn't keep out the rain if it rained heavily. That is, uh, it would shrivel in the sun if the sun was um, fierce, that it would collapse in a wind if the wind was strong, that it would attract lightning if lightning fell near it, that it would prove unlucky if there was any ill luck going about secretly everyone admired it. So this is a, um, a, a slightly funny but a, a, a very important passage which uh, kind of exposes the psyche of the people who are jealous about um, certain material stuff which the other possess, the other person possesses. So um, if you look at the list of um, things that would befall on the umbrella, it's very interesting um, that uh, they say that the umbrella wouldn't keep out the rain, it would shrivel in the sun, uh, it would be affected by wind, it will collapse in the wind and if a lightning strikes, um, the umbrella will attract it and if there was any ill luck, any bad luck going about, again the umbrella would at, uh, attract it. So that was the philosophy that they um, told themselves um, to uh, console themselves um, uh, for the fact that they don't have such an interesting object, but a uh, heart of hearts secretly uh, deep down they really admired the umbrella. So all the natural calamities are sourced um, from the region in which they lived. Um, so these hill folk could think about all these calamities because that is the one that they are familiar with. And um, the passage is also very interesting for its rhetoric, it is put neatly there, there is a lot of parallelism in the uh, way the sentences have been structured. And again the idea of bad luck, that is the most disturbing part um, in the earlier extract. If their idea that um, you know the umbrella is a, a magnet for bad things is, is is a notion that's really disturbing to understand about these uh, village folk. Um, so the the fact that they can wish bad on this uh, umbrella, something that a little girl possesses, is really uh, serious and it, it is a little bit worrying um, on the part of the villagers. So. Uh, but uh, if we need to kind of put this uh, desire in a particular context, in the context of the uh, period in which the uh, hilly, uh, hilly uh, villagers led their lives and um, we need to understand that it is related to an older way of life, um, an older way of life where um, if you had a headache you would apply a leash to your throbbing temple. So there is a reference in the story where um, the narrator says that whenever Ram Barossa had a headache he applied a leech to his throbbing temple and older people still believed in the cure offered by leeches. So um, this particular information um, kind of uh, makes it clear to us that uh, people led very, very um, uh, simple and sometimes backward lives um, in the sense that uh, modernity did not uh, reach them in some areas. So um, you know uh, Binya wore cloth to ward off the evil. So, um, you know lucky charms were believed in and all these cure by leeches were also believed in by the people. So, in that context um, the idea that you know bad luck will come to uh, the person or the, or, or the object of the umbrella is uh, sort of understandable on the part of the villagers. So, um, for them it is all a piece, you know lightning, thunder, rain and sun and bad luck is it all seems to be part of the same uh, stories, the same narrative that they uh, kind of uh, weaved every day, understood, experienced. Okay, so um, the narrator tries to present a contrast between 
uh, the adults' perspective and the children's perspective in terms of the uh, intrusion of the blue umbrella in their village world. So, um, while the adults um, thought that um, you know this umbrella is not good enough, the children thought something the opposite. They thought the uh, reverse of what the adults thought. So, uh, unlike the adults, the children didn't have to pretend. They were full of praise for the umbrella. They knew that if they said the right things about the umbrella, Binya would smile and give it to them to hold for a little while, just a little while. So, uh, the children didn't have to pretend, unlike the adults who really loved the umbrella, but then they pretended to themselves that it is not great and that it will um, create or bring bad luck on the person who has it. Um, uh, how were the children and uh, they, they uh, really were full of praise, they praised the umbrella and <clears throat> the narrator says that and they knew that if they said good things about the umbrella to Binya, she would let them to let them uh, hold the umbrella for a little time, just a little time. Uh, so um, there's a nice contrast here between the children's desire and the adults desire and approach. But the big question is, does the contrast between the children and the adults hold um, hold for a really long time in this particular narrative um, or even for a short time? If you uh, go back to that particular extract and see um, this statement, they knew that if they said the right things about the umbrella, so the, 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 that set of uh, words suggest that there is a little bit of manipulation on the part of the children too um, uh, in which uh, if they said the right thing not the wrong thing by the way if they said the right thing about the umbrella it will have the right effect on Binya and she would let them uh, have the umbrella let them carry the umbrella for a short time. So, children are also manipulative uh, but for different reasons. Um, so, we need to understand that uh, nuance in, in the attitude of the children presented in the narrative. So, um, that black and white contrast between um, you know the goodness of children, the innocence of children, the purity of children versus um, the moral failings of the adults does not seem to hold uh, water in this particular narrative. So, um, both the children and the adults have pretensions of their own, but it is um, uh, it, but it's for different, but the pretensions are for different effect and impact. So, that is what we need to understand. Okay, let me come to the conflicts in the story. There are conflicts in the story, um, even though they are resolved, um, you know, uh, quickly and at least some of them are resolved quickly. So, the first conflict um, in the story is um, with regard to the umbrella and um, the umbra and, and the source of this conflict is nature itself. Um, Binya is sleeping um, by under the shade of a pine tree and there is strong wind and nature lifted, the wind lifted the umbrella and carried it about 6 feet from the sleeping girl and um, the Naruto uh, expresses it beautifully and says the wind was in a wicked playful mood. So, nature is being wicked here, being playful here. It would leave the umbrella alone for a few moments, but as soon as Binya came near, it would pick up the umbrella and send it bouncing, floating, dancing away from her. So, here we have a girl who has been woken up by the strong wind and she realizes the wind has taken the umbrella and she tries to chase the wind, chase the umbrella and repossess it. But the wind is really wicked, nature is really wicked and what it does is it takes the umbrella um, you know far away and it drops it by, um, it drops it over the edge of a cliff. Uh, and the umbrella falls um, into a cherry tree which is growing by the side of a cliff face and, and it is in a precarious uh, position because the cherry tree is growing on the side of a cliff and that tree is about 80 meters from the ground. So, um, Binya does not think more than a second, she just scrambles down the side of the uh, cliff face and um, there is a lot of strength and determination in her to get the 
umbrella back and the narrator says that she felt no fear when she uh, was climbing those um, and, and Brynja felt no fear when climbing trees. In fact, she was proud of the fact that she could climb them as well as Biju. So, she is um, like a mountain goat. Uh, she is like a, um, a, a she is a kind of um, in tune with nature. So, she just scrambles down the cliff face and then she gets to the cherry tree which is uh, growing a slant and then she um, you know crawls on the um, um, uh, on the trunk of the tree and then uh, she looks down and only then she is slightly frightened because she is so far above from the ground and if she uh, falls she would really hit the big boulders um, that are by the side of the river. So, what she does is she just uh, dis, um, uh, entangles the umbrella from the branches and then she um, you know lets the umbrella fall down and the umbrella gently uh, kind of um, falls like a parachute on a, a thicket of nettles and um, you know in a short while she is um, back on ground back near the thicket of um, the clump of nettles and she retrieves the umbrella and then takes it home. So, this is the first conflict in the um, story and she successfully retrieves the umbrella from a really precarious position um, uh, on, on, on the mountains and uh, um, even when the umbrella is caught in the thicket of nettles those stinging plants um, she is immune to them she is unaffected by the nettles uh, she does not care that she has been stung by these plants but, um, but she um, happily retrieves it and goes home and even though it's it's uh, the setup is really precarious and dangerous for the girl she is safe from the elements of nature uh, because she herself seems to be a part of that uh, uh, you know set of um, elements associated with nature so she successfully gets the umbrella back. So, the nature itself seems to play with her uh, in, in taking the umbrella away from her for a short while. Now, the second conflict we have another conflict uh, in which uh, the umbrella is taken away from Binya for the second time uh, and this uh, source is nature once again. So, the wind was um, wicked the first time now we have a creature from nature and you know uh, this one tries to attack uh, attack uh, Binya and um, the episode is this and uh, when Binya is walking down um, a hilly uh, path uh, during the monsoon season she encounters a poisonous snake and um, Binya who always has her umbrella open um, she thrust it forward between herself and the snake and the snake's heart snout thudded twice against the strong silk of the umbrella the reptile then turned and slithered away over the wet rocks disappearing into a cl uh, clump of ferns. So, um, this time um, the um, umbrella comes to the rescue uh, of a Binya somehow uh, because she attacks this uh, poisonous snake with the uh, open umbrella. Uh, she uh, she kind of uses it as a weapon and the snake's hard snout thudded twice against the strong silk of the umbrella. The umbrella does not um, does not kind of give away it the you know the cloth does not uh, tear um, even though the um, snake attacks it and uh, in fact the umbrella is successful in protecting the little girl. So, that reptile just um, you know retreats and slithers away. So, there are two things here the first thing is that it saves uh, importantly it saves Binya from a poisonous snake and the second thing is the umbrella though it is attacked we can see this as an attack on the umbrella too um, the umbrella is safe uh, somehow because it is strong uh, perhaps just like Binya herself you know. Um, so, that is communicated in the second conflict in the story. So, um, the other uh, way to look at it is this, uh, we can see the umbrella itself as a sort of talisman, uh, a kind of a protective charm which uh, functions in the way the leopard's claw is also supposed to function in protecting the girl from any kind of injury or danger. Uh, 
um, but then um, you know the the opinion of the villagers um, when they see the umbrella as a kind of a magnet for um, bad luck is also seem to be realized because if you look at the first conflict um, Binya scrambles down a cliff face she gets down a precarious cliff um, side to get uh, this uh, particular thing and what if she had fallen uh, from so far above she would have died so the umbrella is kind of drawing her into danger that's one way to look at it and even in the second conflict she tries to uh, attack um, the poisonous uh, snake with the umbrella what if the um, umbrella was not a uh, good shield what if um, you know the snake was successful in attacking um, and in tearing the umbrella I mean uh, is the umbrella again uh, an unlucky object that she carries around so those are also um, some of the other interpretations people can come up with thank you for watching I'll continue in the next session